Hello, welcome back to my channel. It's Tuesday, lunchtime. We've had lunch. Socks is cleaning his face after his lunch. Um, and I think he's about to jump over to my chair any minute. Uh, this will go out on Friday, I think. I got my first piece of hate mail on this YouTube channel. As I've been saying, all the um, messages I've had and the comments I've had on these little videos for this past month have been fantastic. Really lovely bookish chat and questions and ideas and people going off and buying books, collecting books that I've mentioned, being reminded of books. Anyway, at the beginning of my channel, there's two compilation uh, films I made of the last two years of Levenshume Pride and the March down Levenshume High Street. Levy Pride is something organised by Jeremy these last uh, seven years or so. It's a big deal around here. <coughs> the, the, a big local pride, the biggest one in Manchester. Very funny. Now we have a very mixed community here uh, with all kinds of people, all walks of life, creeds, races, religion, the whole lot. And uh, it makes for a very lively and uh, brilliant pride. Proper gas, uh, grassroots stuff. Anyway, this comment on one of my films of the Levy Pride March, I don't want to go on about it too much, but somebody comes on saying, no wonder the UK is in decline or something. And I wonder how long these kind of events will go on when uh, uh, Islam takes over the country. Or words to that effect. Anyway, it's a really shitty remark. And um, the person who made it, I forget their name, which I'm glad to, needn't watch my videos anymore. They can go and bugger off. <laughs> Never comment again and take your prejudiced crap elsewhere. And I'll have you know that Levenshume is full of Muslims and it's full of Irish people and Catholics and Protestants and irreligious people and um, witchy people and all kinds of people, queer people, straight people, the whole lot, and cats. Nobody minds about Levy Pride. Everybody is uh, proud of it. And people line the streets. And that kind of crappy setting queers against Muslims, stirring up the crock of shit, the kind of GB news world, can just bugger off. I want nothing to do with it. So take your comment and go, whoever you are. And the rest of you, <laughs> I'm glad to get your comments about books and anything else. Right, rant over. Socks is getting comfy. On my lap, I've got my cup of tea and the sun's streaming in. I'm going out soon. I've got a lovely meeting with a friend um, about a project that hopefully is coming up. Hang on, tea. And first, I want to do a little talk through some books. Um, yep, I've got a pile of things here. There's too many for, for one video, I think. And they're a mix. And looking down, there they are books with pictures, a lot of them, um, that I want to show off. <laughs> books that um, are books about books, a whole genre. That I really love books about books. And this is one of my all-time favourites, Nina Sankovic, Tolstoy and the Purple Chair, which I must have read, yeah, 11 years ago for the first time, during quite a hard time, actually, 2013 was a terrible year in lots of ways. I'll explain someday why. This is a book that comes out of a terrible year for Nina Sankovic, who is an American uh, writer. And she, I think this is her first book. Before she was a writer, like all of us, she was a reader. And when her sister dies, um, it's a family, a very bookish family, and her response is to withdraw into herself and she makes a reading nook for herself in her house with a purple chair. And she reads endlessly. And for a year, she sets herself this task of reading one book per day and then blogging about it. It was the days of blogs when you wrote reviews uh, and posted them. And so she posts a review at the end of each day, having spent the whole day reading uh, a book. And she gets through the year with you know, a book a day. And there's a nice list at the end. But, of course, it's more than that. It's a book about, you know, books saving your life. 
about the people around her as she dedicates herself to this very strange task. The people who help out, the people who suggest watership down <laughs> a huge book, a massive book, um, as something she might want to read in one day. I've just seen that she read The Grotesque by Patrick McGrath and the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society by Marianne Schaffer and Annie Barrows, one of my favourite books ever. Um, I've read this book. This is one of my favourite books. I've read it at least three or four times. I find it is a useful book for jump-starting my own enthusiasm about, about reading. Whenever I think, why am I spending all my time on this stuff in other people's books? And why do I need to? Um, it reminds me of all of that and uh, the benefits, not even the benefits, the essential nature of that. Speaking of which, here's something essential too. Sorry, the light from the window is making it reflect. Where the Wild Things Are. Now, Jeremy got me my first copy of this. I never had it as a kid. For some reason, it's massive in the States. Um, I don't think it was as big a deal here, I don't think. I don't think so, anyway. I um, So I read this much later on, and it kind of strikes all sorts of chords. I do read it as a queer um, fable. I really do. Max going off to where the wild things are in the middle of the night, the place where... The ordinary people and the grown-ups aren't um, his imagination filled with these kind of... Uh, whoops, sorry, socks. These creatures, these hairy beasts. <laughs> and I do think it's a kind of a gay boy story. Sendak, of course, was gay. And I think um, that fables and fairy tales and children's stories reach deep into our psyches when we write them or remember them or or reread them and i think we put a lot of ourselves in in the making of them and whether that's me reading into it which is a, a kind of qu classic queer reading strategy or sendak put it there who knows it doesn't matter it's the fallacy of authorial intention as they always told us to me it's there and being the king in this kingdom of wild beasts is a gay story that sky oh can you see it the colors sendak's colors are um kind of faded and edwardian i always think his world is kind of uh the colors of maps you know those old-fashioned maps that were never quite accurate and had monsters around the edges that's what his stuff looks like to me everything of his i've enjoyed but it is most peculiar i think it's, again, the thing that I look for, a world unto itself. Nobody else's world is quite like that, and um, you can't get that flavour of book anywhere else, only in, in his world. Similarly, Quentin Blake's drawings. Here he's paired with um, Joe Nakin for a series of fairy tales that came out in ninety five, and I had no money in 1995. I was publishing my first novel, I was finishing my PhD, I had no teaching work, and I lived in Edinburgh on a pittance, and I did little but write and read and run about the city. And I bought this book in hardback for full price that year because it seemed essential. It was £9.99 from uh, Jonathan Cape, I think, yeah. who I've said elsewhere did Nothing but fancy books and <laughs> expensive books. And of course, that was the year that I went to uh, Random House on Vauxhall Bridge Road to meet the people at uh, Chateau and Windus next door to Jonathan Cape. It was amazing to find they were just two little offices side by side, like a kind of antiquated English department. That's how literary fiction looked in those days. Maybe it still does. Um, the drawings in this are beautiful, very, very scratchy and cursory at times, I'd say, but full of life, and that's the point. 
I've actually seen film of him working. And the speed is all illusory, I think. I think the initial sketches are in a flash. And then there's paper laid over in a light box and he scritchy scratches over the top with ink and watercolour. And it was the watercolours that allured me here and the fact he lets them run into the black lines. <laughs> And he draws in things like brown ink and um, green ink. Look at those pterodactyls. And there's a bear on the back cover playing a flute or being, being drawn by the flute. He's the sleepwalking bear. Yep. Anyway, this book is highly, oh, there he is. Highly recommended. <clears throat> I've just seen a little letter tucked in the back from Chato and Windus. Yep, changes to the, but please let them know if there's any final changes to be made to my novel. This is in uh, summer 1995. Right, here's another great uh, writer about writing, Natalie Goldberg, who I must have mentioned before. She wrote Writing Down the Bones, one of the great uh, books about um, creative writing and Zen, and writing practice. She wrote this book about painting and how she'd been, a not so much secret as modest painter all her life. And eventually she comes to write about this, um, these slightly naive, I think, kind of slightly um, uh, Chagall-like, pictures of hers, where everything floats around in a kind of morass of bright colour. In a way, she does everything wrong. All of her perspective, all of her technique. Of course, I've said before, technique is the killer, or thinking you have to have the technique <laughs> in any art form. It can be a real killer. Um, in that people become slavishly devoted to other people's ways of doing things. Always a bad idea. It's nice to know what the techniques are and then casually dismiss them in your own work. But she seemed to layer watercolour, layer upon layer, until the paper's just about obliterated. Sometimes it works and the colours really sing. But she talks about using the cheapest materials, about drawing wherever, whenever, a kind of guerrilla warfare on art. And I really enjoyed the way she talked about it. This is the fancy edition of the book. There was an earlier one with fewer drawings and fewer chapters, and I got this just as I bought everything else by, by her, Natalie Goldberg, and she has a new book out this year, which I'm very pleased about. This is a book, an annual, a very plain-looking annual compared with most of the uh, kids' books published for Christmas, the Joe Annual, from, it turns out, it was in papers. A psychedelic age. It comes from 69, I think. Um, yeah, the year I was born. Uh, written and drawn by Alison Prince and Joan Hickson. Not, I think, the Miss Marple Joan Hickson. This was a find that came out of the blue. I think it's a beautiful book. It's mostly prose stories with illustrations that are kind of a bit you can see Torve Janssen in them. You can see a touch of the Moomins. The Spook of the Snow. My story, oh, because it's like a kind of Chaucerian thing with everybody in, uh, from this cast of characters telling their own tales to fill an annual. It's a kind of metafictional annual in some ways. My story, said Angie, is about a girl called Tora who lived in a land of ice and snow far away in the North Pole. Tora's father played trombone and her mother played the spoons and penny whistle. When they both played together, it sounded marvellous, a mixture of tootle and rattle and blare, if you can imagine it. Quite often in the dark evenings, they would climb into their sledge, wrapped firmly in furs, and drive way across the snow to the village. There they would play the trombone, spoons and penny whistle half the night, while the villagers sang and danced and drank hot toddy. Tora usually went with her parents on these outings, but as she grew older, she began to think the music they made was loud and crude. She despised the jolly evenings in the village. She 
turning into a snob. And she would go for long walks alone across the snow, warm and snug in her furs and high boots. She would listen to the whistle of the icy wind and the screech of the seabirds, and one day she fancied she heard something else too, a thin, clear song that seemed to come from the sky. She stared up into the grey clouds and seemed to see something silvery darting about, something as quick as a fish and light as a bird. Well, do come down and let me see you, cried Tora. At once, in a flurry of snowflakes, a strange being stood before her, half woman, half bird, gleaming and silvery with a mane of shining hair and huge white wings. Were they wings, or was it a white cloak whirling in the wind? Who are you? asked Tora, fascinated and half afraid. I am Spook of the Snow, whispered the creature in a voice as soft as a bird's footfall. Tora reached out her hand, but the spook at once moved away in a puff of icy wind. You cannot touch me. No human being can touch me. The whole thing is very atmospheric. Yep. Really lovely book and a great find. Okay. I'm going to stop quite soon. Uh, but here's something, another bookish book. The Literary Almanac. Now, at first, I thought this was probably not worth my while. A year of seasonal reading. And I think I, I was after something to oh, give me reading suggestions that would let me feel a part of that kind of um, uh, bookish excitement. Not that I need it, really. I don't need suggestions. But every now and again, you'll have this urge for a kind of a booky book. <laughs> that sounds stupid. In the way that you have, you know, wanting to watch other people's YouTube videos about their reading. I like the insights into people's reading lives. And this is something that goes through the, the, the months of the year. And each month suggests an interesting thing to read. A lot of them I have read, of course, but um, uh, not of course. Of course not. But um, some of them have read, and there's interesting suggestions that come out of nowhere. This person, uh, Francesca Bowman, is quite good on um, books in translation, books all around the world, and that interests me, I think. For the first time, I suddenly thought, what a great project that would be, to follow the Atlas around the world and read one book famous in each of its countries and see how far you could get around the world without all the hassle of actual travel. I did think that would be interesting as a project. I see there that she writes a chapter. This would have swayed me. She writes a chapter about The Fortnight in September by R.C. Sheriff, a novel from 1931, a seaside novel about a family holiday that is absolutely stunning. It's one of the most wonderful books I've read, and it's, it's published by Persephone, republished by Persephone in recent years and I would recommend it highly. Somebody suggested that I write down a list of all the books I um, recommend in these <coughs> uh, videos, uh, which would be a good idea if I could get round to it. I'll try and remember. If anybody else feels like listing the things I mentioned, please do. Um, some bits are kind of a bit crappy, like ten Top 10 school curriculum classics that are not nearly as boring as you remember them. Number one, War and Peace. Number two, Orlando. Number three, Great Expectations. I, I don't get that, really. Uh, what they're trying to prove there, really. Um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of modern day things as well. Modish books that are dropped in that kind of uh, put me off them, <laughs> actually. When people go on and on about things that are kind of here and in your face all the time, and then they're recommended again. I get put off even further. Which is interesting. Uh, I think suggestions are good things, but you can uh, be uh, put off by too much pushiness. So my idea for this, these videos especially, is just to, to float these ideas at you, to suggest them uh, gently as things I've liked and you might like to find for yourself or explore. I won't be saying, this is essential, this is a must-read, all that kind of aggressive stuff. No. It'll be a bit like the Levy Pride Parade, where you just shove everyone together and everyone marches to um, a series of tacky disco songs, but everybody's there. 
and it's all to um, to amuse you, to uh, uh, make you think, to make you feel part of something. And that's what suggestions should be, not uh, finger wagging. You ought to read this. You ought to know about this because that is always off putting. Right. I'm going to go. I'm at 20 minutes, which is about as long as I need to take up. It's uh, sunny and I'm going to go out and if I can dislodge the cat from my lap. Take care and do subscribe and do leave comments below. Okay, see you again in the next episode.